In the interest of making sure that you have enough time, we have enough time for questions. Why don't we just go ahead and get started? So welcome everyone uh, to our town hall this morning slash afternoon, depending on when you're where you're at. Um, we are very fortunate today to have uh, Dr. Daniel es Escudero uh, share with us his work uh, in um, Miami and thinking about achieving the getting to zero objectives in Miami. So just a little background, uh, Dr. Escudero is a research associate in the Department of Epidemiology at the Chan School of Public Health. Uh, his work has focused on the prevention of HIV among marginalized populations, particularly those who inject drugs, uh, those who are sexual minorities, migrants, and those most recently uh, in highly endemic settings. His work has focused on the uses of PrEP for HIV prevention, as well as treatment as prevention. So, uh, and he's done some work uh, with mathematical modeling to get a sense of really, uh, and using traditional epidemiological tools to get a sense of how those uh, strategies might be, have an impact and are effective. So he's done work both uh, domestically, uh, we'll hear about his work in Miami, as well as internationally doing some work in Botswana. So uh, typically we like to have these presentations be about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes. And that way we'll have some time for questions afterwards. So uh, thank you very much, Dr. Escudero, for uh, joining us and take it away. Thanks, thanks so much. Um... Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for uh, for inviting me. This is my first town hall. So um, I should say that typically, I mean, just about any time I give a lecture, um, I'm always happy to get interruptions. I realize that people tend to be a little more hesitant to do that over Zoom and um, not exactly sure the protocol. But if anyone feels like asking a question, please feel free to interrupt. This is not, you know, timed or cadenced by, by any means on my side. So uh, please feel free to do so. Um, if not, we'll just have time at, at the end. But um, we will get into um, some methods uh, sort of work here. This does focus on sort of the, um, the sequelae, the sort of downstream effects of some of our assumptions and our methods. So hopefully um, some folk on the call are interested in that and just sort of interrogating how our approach really informs, you know, the findings that we expect to, to come to by the end of this project. Um, it is an ongoing project, so uh, this is uh, all sort of related to a K award that um, I have through NIAD, which um, goes for an, a few more years. And so this is basically an overview of our general approach, our sort of early, um, our early findings, and the sort of strategy we're taking to really comprehensively look at the potential for Miami to reach, you know, zero new infections uh, sometime in the future. So with that, um, I think we'll get started. I will apologize for the egregiously plain background I have here. This is my, my kitchen wall we just moved. So it's actually um, an unbridled hellscape in every other room. So this one should be um, a bit more tame. So I apologize for that, but why don't we get started? Um, Again, I'll, we'll monitor the chat too. So if folks have questions, sure. we can pose them as they pop up there. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel free to to write in a question. Maybe you know, in between slide transitions or something, we can we can talk if there is an opportune time. Um, but again, feel free to interrupt whenever. I'm I'm perfectly happy to talk through things. It actually makes a lot more fun, especially over Zoom. You know, keep our interest up. So uh, today, first, we're going to talk briefly about the HIV epidemic in Miami. I realize that's the other side of the country for many of you, so maybe some of this will be uh, sort of new data. We'll talk about the Miami-Dade um, Getting to Zero Task Force, which was established a few years ago. It's sort of, um, it's a bit uh, esoteric whether or not this, this entity still exists. It, um, it codified some recommendations for Getting to Zero for Miami, and it sort of had its challenges, uh, not unlike other Getting to Zero coalitions throughout the country. And so we'll talk briefly about their recommendations. And we'll talk about sort of the crux of our approach, the model that we're using in order to investigate the effectiveness of uh, these recommendations and also other um, strategies in Miami. And we'll also talk about uh, the work in progress in order to sort of adapt the uh, framework we have to be able to answer those questions. And then we'll briefly run through the limitations um, of which we will only have time to discuss a few. So uh, this is a brief overview of surveillance estimates uh, for uh, Miami-Dade County. This is 2017, uh, not much has changed um, in the one extra year that we have. 
um, information for we do have 2018 uh, we haven't quite seen 2019 released yet um, but this is not um, this has not changed very much in the last two years you can see here um, coincidentally the blue squares the blue diamonds and the orange bars um, line up quite nicely that doesn't necessarily need to be the case we're looking at both prevalence in each of these um, uh, precincts and regions and also uh, New, di new diagnoses. So new diagnoses are in the blue diamonds. You can see here that we have over a thousand um, new diagnoses in Miami-Dade County. So just about any time we refer to Miami in this lecture, we'll be referring to Miami-Dade County. It's more or less contiguous. Um, you can see that the, um, the metropolitan statistical area in that um, second bar from the left is actually not faring very well either uh, nationally. It's quite outpacing all metropolitan statistical areas and the rest of the US. Um, so both as a city, as a county, and as a, as a region, Miami is, is not faring very well at all. And you'll see that um, this has been true historically. So um, we have a 20 year compilation here of new diagnoses in Miami-Dade County. This is per 100,000. And so obviously we're, we're ecstatic to see this decrease from 98 to 2006 or so. Uh, before we reach a bit of a plateau. Um, many HIV epidemiologists um, on this call would probably recognize this as, as a pretty secular trend throughout the, the country as a whole. So this is more or less following a trend that we saw throughout the country in, in reducing new diagnoses. Um, but unfortunately, though, this plateau is not necessarily um, a, a secular trend throughout the country. We do see some other cities performing much better than this, San Francisco among them. And so we are trying to look at these data and say, okay, well, how can we um, sort of remove ourselves from this somewhat intractable plateau that uh, Miami has been in for more or less the, the last uh, 10 years or so? And I will say uh, the 2018 data that have been released uh, does show a slight uptick here from that sort of that slow downward trend from 2015. So that was a bit disappointing, but it, it wasn't um, a big outlier. It was a small tick up. So just to orient ourselves to some of the, uh, the risk behavior um, that translates into new infections in Miami-Dade County, this is uh, taken from AIDS view from 2011 to 2015. And we can see in these pie charts, you can think of them sort of as constituent risks um, or causal pies, if you will, um, what risk behavior is causing uh, what proportion of new infections. We have males on the left and females on the right. And you can see that some things are, are sort of curiously small as part of this constituent pie. We see that injection drug use among people who inject is actually quite low, especially among males in, in Miami-Dade. This is quite surprising. I will say that um, these data would need to be interrogated a bit more um, skeptically, I would say, in order to sort of confirm that, that amount. Um, I have worked with um, populations of people who inject drugs um, earlier in my career, and I would say this, this is a bit surprising. And given what we know about the risk community, especially in say the Overtown area of, of Miami-Dade, um, this is quite surprising. So I, I, I imagine that there's gonna be future research um, in, in upcoming years, especially with the opioid crisis, to see if this, if this trends upwards. Um, we will see that uh, much like the rest of the country, most of um, new HIV diagnoses are among men who have sex with men. Among women, a substantial risk factor is heterosexual contact. And uh, this may not look altogether differently from many other US cities. What we have here is a, um, a graphical depiction of Miami-Dade County uh, at the zip code level. You can see that although we do have um, uh, a, an area of, of, higher, of higher incidence uh, in sort of downtown Miami, you can see that area left of Miami Beach, it is not a, a monotonic relationship. I think this is important to note just because keeping geography in mind is I think always hugely important. Um, we can see that risk actually does augment quite a bit as we get further down uh, south towards say the, the homestead area. And so this is an important um, facet of the epidemic. It's not sort of just a monotonic, oh, you know, downtown populations, uh, and, you know, and, and it just gets less risky out in the suburbs. That's not necessarily the case. So this is the HIV care continuum. Um, given that this is uh, a Caps Town Hall, I don't think I need to belabor the importance of, of these data too much. Uh, but I will say there is a hugely important um, part of this, uh, this puzzle here that we 
that we really have a very distinct sort of blind spot. And I'll say that's the undiagnosed population in Miami. Uh, in many other cities, there are more comprehensive studies to show uh, fairly rigorous estimates for the undiagnosed population. I would argue that is not necessarily the case in Miami. Uh, it, is a, it is a site for the, um, for the ongoing cycles of the National HIV Behavioral Surveillance System. Many of you, I'm sure, will be familiar with NHBS. And so it's great that we have those cycles, each of those three cycles uh, that are ongoing, um, but those are really the only source of um, estimates for the undiagnosed population in Miami. And so I would say that that is, you know, a, a level of rigor that we can certainly exceed in the future. And I, I'm sure that the Florida Department of Health would also agree. Um, it's currently estimated um, that the undiagnosed population represents about 14% uh, of the population. Um, so, you know, that would be 14% on top of the 27,000 that are um, already diagnosed. And this is a couple years ago. So this will have increased by about um, 2000 since then. Uh, we do see that viral suppression is more or less on par with a national trend. Um, we would all like to get this much, much higher for obvious reasons for, you know, treating, uh, for treating disease and those who are, who are infected and for you know, stemming new infections. Uh, the goal obviously is to, is to get that right most bar as, as high as we can. So if that's um, an albeit brief overview of the, um, of the epidemic in Miami, obviously things have also gotten quite a bit more complicated with uh, Miami being an epicenter of the COVID pandemic. We can actually talk about that for a few minutes. I'd be excited to, at the end of this, to talk about some related work, but that is um, a quick you know, 10 minute snapshot of the uh, Miami epidemic. So here we're gonna talk briefly about the Getting to Zero Task Force. If you remember, this was formed a few years ago and uh, much like the other Getting to Zero Task Forces, dozens of them for cities all around the country, cities and states, um, they found that many of the evidence-based uh, strategies that we already knew about would be the most effective ways of tackling the epidemic. So they recommended things like expansion of PEP, PrEP, routine HIV testing, especially in healthcare settings, reducing time to diagnoses and increasing linkage to care. I say this not to belabor uh, the fact that we all know these things work in reducing new infections, but just to show that um, these were not particularly um, out of the box, not to be punitive um, sort of strategies. These were, these were um, you know, well-known evidence-based strategies where the task force is saying, basically, if we can do these right, then we can get close to getting to zero, which is you know, largely the case for many settings. But we see again here that these need to be targeted quite specifically to the needs of Miami-Dade County. And we'll get further into what those needs are um, in this talk. So as proposed by the task force, we sort of come to the next logical question, which is, you know, will Miami get to zero new infections? Will we be able to achieve any of these goals? Um, if so, when? and uh, what could be done to get us there faster and more efficiently. This is sort of the question that just about every um, epidemiologic modeler asks himself at some point, you know, how can we take what we know works if it's done in an ideal setting and how can we get there faster and more efficiently and um, how can we sort of uh, prognosticate uh, what the outcomes will be. So that's where this project comes in and that's where we'll be talking about our agent-based model where we can ask and hopefully answer some of these questions. So this is where we get into some of the, uh, the under the hood stuff uh, where we're gonna actually look at the modeling approach we're taking. I hope all of you um, are interested in sort of taking a quick peek under this hood. I think it's really interesting because everything we do here informs the findings that eventually we publish and say, okay, this is what's gonna happen. I don't want anyone on this call to assume that what we're doing is right just because it's what we're doing. I think that we should interrogate every step and I'm happy to have people sort of um, bring in their own, um, their own expertise on, on what assumptions may be tenable and, and maybe what are, um, are not optimal. So I say that and I present this, uh, this sort of general SEIR model um, to say exactly what our model is not. <laughs> it's, it's almost counterintuitive. I'm putting this up here to say that we are not doing this but this is what most people are familiar with, so I feel like this is a nice sort of um, entrance into the approach itself. So here we have your basic SEIR model. 
where we have population compartments in each of these um, almost squares in the blue, yellow, red, and green squares. And so you have your susceptible population exposed, infected, and recovered. When dealing with HIV, we can pretty much you know, knock off that last compartment because all but you know, two people in the world are, are recovered from this fully. So um, we can really think of this as an SEI model. And what these typically do are just estimate the amount of time it takes for given amounts of a specific population to transition to exposed and infected. And so we have forces of infection, we have recovery times, et cetera, which again might not apply here. Um, but this is the, the typical um, standard way of modeling uh, outcomes for something like this, for questions like this. But I would argue that this way might not be uh, sophisticated enough to tackle some of the questions that we really want to get down to. So that's why we're talking today instead about an agent-based model. Some of you may be familiar with these as individual-based models. Um, sometimes they're termed microsimulations. These are, these are more or less interchangeable. Um, for better and for worse, there are, there are some subtle differences sometimes, but um, you can think of this as an individual-based microsimulation, where just like here, instead of modeling the transition times uh, between susceptibility and risk behavior and infection um, and transmission, we're modeling individuals. So just like an SEIR model models everything on a population level, it takes everyone that essentially has the same characteristics, sticks them in the same bucket, and then has them um, transition to other states. We're doing the same thing essentially, except we're explicitly following each and every individual within our micro simulation. And we're also um, uh, explicitly forming a risk network so individuals in the network are connected explicitly, again, to other individuals in the network, which drastically uh, impact their risk. So I think this is a very sort of important facet, and we'll go through a short illustration uh, that I think will, will help some of you uh, that may be new to this. So again, our agents or our individuals represent people. These are, uh, this is a distinct approach from an SER uh, or SIR um, compartmental model. And the next you know, question you might have is, well, why, why are we using this overly sophisticated method? I mean, that's a very valid question. I would say that like many getting to zero programs, the success of these efforts are really hard to predict. You have essentially the same existence of evidence-based strategies in Miami as you do San Francisco or New York, but you see completely different um, trajectories of the epidemic. And so, what we need to do is figure out what are some of the nuances, why is that the case? If we have the same ART lines available, if we have the same PrEP available, we have the same FDA in Florida versus California and New York, but for some reason we see very drastically different levels of access and diversity in the distribution of services. And so I will say that the synergistic and antagonistic potentially effects of all of these different evidence-based strategies uh, lead to the uh, need for additional complexity. We have a sortivity and stratification in social and sexual networks. We know that uh, based on demography and based on um, sexual orientation, we can see drastically um, compartmentalized sexual networks. And there's also a very heterogeneous distribution of services. For instance, you may be less likely to have access to PrEP if you're a, um, a Hispanic MSM in Miami versus a white MSM. And so this, I think, will be helpful, especially for those who maybe don't um, deal with epidemiologic models uh, frequently. It will sort of just take us through uh, exactly what our model does. Um, this is just one example. We're going to be looking at the HIV uh, continuum and also transmission. Lots of other things are simulated in the model, but this is just sort of um, uh, uh, an introductory example. So for each of these um, time steps, these yellow numbers in the blue circles, these represent one month of elapsed time in the model. So you can think of this as you know, July to August transition. And here we're gonna take a look at uh, one specific example. This is just a uh, simulated example. We have agent alpha is essentially born into the model. And so this person, um, this person is either born uh, stochastically based on birth rates, fertility rates, and what we see within the Miami population. We can also talk about inward migration as well. Um, or they could be born at the beginning of, of our sort of time period. 
for this case, it doesn't matter. Uh, we assume that there is a period of time where uh, individuals are not sexually active. This is, of course, borne by the data, although some suggest that you know, sexual debut is quite early in some populations. Um, this happens to assume, this particular example just assumes a sexual debut at 17 years old. And so we have Agent Alpha, who is initially not connected to anyone, and of course is um, uninfected because they were not perinatally infected uh, in this case. And so they have had no prior partners. So they are, of course, HIV uninfected at this point. Um, at this point, about a year later, we see that Agent Alpha has formed two sexual partnerships. And these partnerships with uh, Gamma and Beta um, have the potential for HIV transmission if someone within the network has HIV. This is pretty intuitive. Uh, but a lot of other things also go into whether or not transmission events occur or whether or not um, individuals form relationships. So the demographics of Agent Alpha play a huge role in who they are able to form sexual partnerships with. The types of relationships that form, we'll see in a few minutes that these can be quite, uh, quite varied. Uh, so there's a lot of sort of data informing who connects to whom and whether or not transmission occurs. So we'll see here um, a number of years later uh, that we have uh, a transmission event essentially. So here, um, lowercase delta over here, a new partner uh, has diagnosed HIV infection, but we can see by the orange color denoting that um, delta is not biologically suppressed. So there's actually a pretty substantial um, probability that over enough sexual acts they will transmit. Uh, in this case, at you know whatever month 271 is, they have transmitted uh, HIV infection to Agent Alpha, who now has undiagnosed acute infection. And so along with acute infection, as many of you will know, will come viremia and a very highly augmented probability of transmitting in this case due to their viremia and some of the characteristics of, of, the, uh, of the virus itself. And we can see that if we follow this person over another year or so, we can see that they have now transmitted to agent beta. And so both of them have undiagnosed infections and since they're not suppressed, uh, they have a pretty substantial probability of, of onward transmission. And here we can see that um, a little while later, Agent Alpha has managed to have diagnosed infection. Agent Delta has become biologically suppressed after having been on therapy for about a year, we see. And so these are some of the many, many things that we track in the model in order to best, um, in a comprehensive manner, see you know, what the sexual networks look like, the topology of them. We're informed by all sorts of um, sexual health surveys. NHBS is another example. We, we glean a lot of data from there on sexual risk behavior. Um, so we, we first try to get the topology of the network right. We try to get the assortivity of sexual context right. And then, of course, we have to get the, um, uh, the probability of being diagnosed, of enrolling on ART, then virologically suppressing uh, one's infection. And these are all informed by uh, the CPAC model, which some of you may be familiar with. It's been a prolific um, sort of disease model for a number of years. And we embed their sort of estimates on, um, on uh, sort of disease progression, natural history, and um, ART within our model. So, so we, we sort of piggyback on something they've been doing very well for a lot of years. Uh, I will say that this model allows us to sort of bring this all home. This allows us to estimate historical dynamics of the epidemic and also potentially determine the effectiveness of future interventions. That's exactly what we're looking to do. We're first looking to replicate what's going on, and then we can look directly down and say, okay, well, if we did X, Y, or Z, what will the outcomes be? So here I'll take you through um, some of the sort of... Uh, some of the different facets of the model. I'll probably go a little quick because I realize we do have somewhat limited time here and I wanna leave a lot of time for questions. So um, please forgive me if we go through this a little quickly, but please let's, let's circle back if we have any questions. Um, so those with a steady, without a steady partner um, can seek other types of partners. You can only have one steady partner at a time. We essentially um, limit to uh, each sexual um, relationship into four different categories. So those are steady partners, regular partners, something akin to a boyfriend or a girlfriend, a casual partner, which would be a one-off, and then a commercial sex worker, um, which has played a hugely important role in some of the prior analyses in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, where some of this work has, has really driven the origins of some of the epidemic, or at least uh, supposedly. Uh, 
Um, and so we are taking these same relationship categories and we're modifying them to, to use them into our Miami investigations. And so um, we're, we're obviously not gonna have time to talk about all the different diversity of uh, sexual risk behaviors, uh, but I will just take a second to mention a few of the things that we sort of account for. So each relationship has a specific duration, uh, which is of course uh, stochastically varied for each simulation, but um, this is done within prior distributions. So for instance, a steady partnership may have an average duration of say 10 years, uh, be Poisson distributed, and a regular partnership may have a duration of more of on the order of two or three years. Uh, we of course vary the probability of using a condom based on these different relationship types and what we know about the demographics themselves. We also do this with coital acts, so the number of times that people have sex in a given time period. Uh, these are all distributed. Uh, concurrency, which is, was a very hot topic a number of years ago, many of you will, will remember. Um, that topic has sort of waned, I would say, in the last few years, but uh, I will say that concurrency is explicitly modeled in this um, approach, and we can sort of interrogate if it's of, if it's of interest, um, sort of the role that concurrency does play, uh, because of course it is, it is quite common in the data and quite common in, in the model. And of course, HIV transmission is, is one of the most important things that we approximate. And this can be determined by the, the type of, of sex that's, um, that's being had. The, of course, the coital acts, the condom use, circumcision status, of course, is very important uh, for men. And then PrEP status will, of course, uh, influence your probability of acquiring. And I show this very briefly. I don't want anyone to focus on the numbers per se. Um, this is just, you know, estimates that were provided a number of years ago, a meta-analysis that showed the probability of transmitting um, based on each sexual act uh, at a given viral load for the index um, partner. And I say this because these numbers are obviously quite precise. These are point estimates. Um, there's nothing to say that these are true in reality or in nature. And we have to deal with a great deal of uncertainty within almost every parameter we model. And so I just like to give this as a good example of things that we're not very certain on, especially if you take more recent data. I just took a snapshot earlier today to put this in there. This was a study that, that showed um, something much more optimistic, which is saying that uh, with adequate uh, viral suppression, uh, transmission is, is negligible. It's not even monitored over you know, several thousands of person years. And so that's fantastic news. Uh, but it also does mean that our estimates uh, from earlier are not necessarily accurate. And so how do we deal with that kind of uncertainty within the model? Again, I'm going to go with this, go through this maybe a little quicker than I would ordinarily like to, just to save some time for things that you may be interested in, in going through more in detail. But we do need to obviously calibrate the model. That's something that um, helps remove some of the sort of black box um, sort of perceptions that we have with, with sort of big complex models like this. Uh, this has been previously published. We've, um, we've done, uh, actually before I joined the, the lab I'm currently in in Harvard, um, some work was published on an earlier uh, calibration protocol for this. Uh, we don't need to belabor it, but um, we can say that there are lots of different parameters that we need to feed into the model as inputs that we're just very uncertain about. Sort of, you know, the, uh, the probability that you acquire a partner of a given type at a given time. I mean, who, wh where can you find a survey that tells you definitively what it will be for, you know, for any one person, let alone for an actual real person in reality? And so these are things that we have to sort of find a reconciliation for. And so what we do is we take um, a sort of Bayesian melded approach where we take Bayesian priors, things that we feel really encompass the bounds of what we think is reasonable. So this prior range, you can think of it as the bracket on either side of saying, okay, we know that people don't within this you know, given community acquire a new partner every week. That would be ridiculous. Those aren't borne out in the data and it doesn't you know, pass the, uh, the sniff test. And so we can say we can reasonably bound it at a week. That's not a true um, scenario, but uh, that's just one example. And you can also say we bound it by say, once every 10 years because we know that people find new partners more frequently than once every 10 years. And so this would be a very wide range, but you know, maybe not atypical for some of the data we have, which are pretty sparse. And so first we bound it, and then we say, okay, things within these bounds may at least be reasonable. We can't, we can't um, uh, throw them out outright. 
And so we form these sets, essentially, of uniform distributions within each of these bounds. We select prior values. And so we say, OK, maybe if we sample these data, almost like a bootstrapping technique, you know, many, many hundreds of thousands of times, uh, will we be able to come up with a set of values that best approximate the data that we know to be fairly accurate? And so that's what we do. So we generate these sets. And we do on the order of you know, 500,000 or a million. And most of these, as you could probably guess, are really junk. You know, they, get, um, they get sampled from way over on one side of a distribution, and they create something that's, that's truly untenable. And so what we do is we, we toss them out. And how do we do that? We first find other things that we feel fairly certain on. So for instance, I, I spoke about the probability of acquiring a partner um, being bounded. Uh, we can also take what we know truly about partnerships in reality uh, through surveys and say, okay, at any given cross-sectional point, we know that not more than, say, 90% of people are in a steady relationship at any given time. So we can say that if a certain simulation creates a network in which more than 90% of people have a steady partnership at any given time, we know that's not true. We know it's not reflecting reality. So we toss it out. And we do that with a number of these different behavioral checks. That's our, our first phase. So first, we have a sort of burn-in period to reach equilibrium. I won't go into that unless people want me to. Um, and what happens is we, we then toss out everything that doesn't meet the multitude of behavioral checks. So we at least know that everything that's made it up into this point has at least some tenable inputs for the things that we're most uncertain about and tenable outputs as well. And then after that, this is just a sample of some of the things we, we go through. Uh, after that, we need to wait these runs because some perform very, very well validated against uh, true data or rather empirical data, um, the best of our uh, you know, ability to estimate. Uh, so this is one example. So we, we can weight the, um, the performance of each of these runs by say the HIV prevalence in each age, sex and racial or ethnic stratum. And so we do this because I believe this is something that's fairly new within the protocol that I more or less um, was keen to add uh, because it's a very uh, stringent test, a very high hurdle, if you will, in order to replicate the, um, it's too bad I can't actually point. Usually I'd have a laser pointer here, but uh, you'll just have to sort of follow my imaginary finger. I can use the mouse. Um, I would say, I would argue that it's quite difficult for most models to approximate some of the nuances within these, you know, these curves, these bumps, and these troughs. And so uh, if a run is able to replicate some of these empirical data, I would say it's, it's passed a fairly rigorous test. And so this is our, our phase two, and we take a compilation of all of the runs that, that did well enough to make it to this point, and then we weight them by their, their performance at that point. And so this gives us a sort of a composite where we can say, all right, if we run this into the future, we feel very confident that um, this is replicating to the best that we can what's actually going on within these communities. And this is an example of, of where a similar protocol, um, there have been some changes in the last few years, but this was published a, a number of years ago where we were able to show that the trajectories in South Africa um, from the best fitting runs, so those in red, we're able to better approximate where the epidemic was for this specific age uh, group. And so we can see that uh, we have the empirical data fit in by those stars and the confidence intervals around them. And we can see that um, where the epidemic actually did go in these years, say 2002 to 2014, uh, the better uh, performing runs, the, ones, the runs with the higher weights, did better approximate. So this is more of a proof of concept. I don't say that this should necessarily weigh in on our current analyses, but it's just sort of a proof of concept for the protocol itself. And so here, uh, I'll just take you as brief as I can through some of the work in progress we have that really we need to consider very thoughtfully if we're able to perform the analyses that I spoke about before. So these probably won't surprise you. We need to talk about PrEP, uh, targeted and universal HIV testing, linkage to care interventions, incarceration, inward migration. These are huge factors, uh, particularly in Southern Florida. Uh, sexual behavior that we hadn't previously modeled. All of, these, um, all of these things are enhancements that are currently being worked on within the model. Uh, one of the things that we can take uh, a brief uh, couple minutes to talk about is PrEP in Miami. Um, some of you may be familiar with the AIDS view data. I think these data are great. That's why I actually just 
took a screenshot of them. I didn't want to put them in my own graph and make it seem like I was you know, coming up with this myself. These are the AIDS view data coming out of Emory um, in Patrick Sullivan's lab. So we can see here Miami at the 331 zip three level. So this is essentially a zip code with the last two digits cut off. We can see that in 2016, only 980 um, uh, PrEP users were identified through this study, which is obviously pretty small. It's gone up since then, but um, the data are not necessarily as solid as, as we have for 2016. And I would also like to point out that this value, this 58 out of, um, it's a PrEP rate, so it's probably 58 out of, uh, I would bet, uh, 100,000 persons. Um, is, it's quite lower than many other cities that you might recognize. Some of you may recognize uh, the zip code for New York up there at the top, 100, where we have a much, much uh, larger rate of PrEP enrollment in New York versus Miami. And as we've already discussed, the epidemic in Miami is far worse than it is in New York. And so um, unfortunately, the access to PrEP doesn't necessarily um, equate based on the burden that we see. And so here's where we sort of jump into a macro view of the model itself. So here's where we integrated PrEP within the model. Um, so we use a great program here, Gephi, which, uh, with ma which maps out our network. And I know this is a little busy, but uh, you don't need to um, understand what every color is. I'll take you uh, through the most important facets of this. And so each of the nodes or the circles in there with the colors uh, represent a status. So the dark blue are on PrEP. You won't see any of those here because no one in this simulation was on PrEP yet. We have HIV negative in a light blue, and then we have uh, HIV positive in a, in a red. And the redness of the HIV positive color is, denotes the, uh, the viral load. So those with a very dark color, for instance, this one over here, is very large, so it means they have a lot of partners, and it means that they also have a high viral load. So if we're talking about the risk of transmission, that would be really centered on, on this individual and maybe to a lesser extent, this individual. And the edges, so the links between those nodes are the type of sexual relationship that is occurring. So here we've added uh, a large amount of PrEP with, into the model. And so this is, this is loosely based on some demographic data that we have in Miami, the best we could do sort of preliminarily. And we see that uh, those connected to the dark blue are less likely to do, uh, um, uh, to acquire HIV infection, unsurprisingly, because these dark blue uh, nodes are no longer infected or they're no longer eligible for infection if they're on PrEP and uh, adherent to PrEP. We do have a um, uh, sort of extra finer detail about the adherence to PrEP within this. We don't really have time to go into it, but just note the fact that we do uh, reconcile the fact that not everyone on PrEP is adherent and fully protected. Uh, so we can see here that, you know, proof of concept, we do see that large amounts of PrEP within the population does, it, it turns out, perhaps unsurprisingly, reduce HIV acquisition within this population. But the most important thing that we need to know is, you know, who is actually getting on PrEP right now? Um, as we can see, it's, it's relatively few people in Miami. Um, who do we need to give it to to make this most efficient? Who would be best eligible? Who would be best reached by the, the existing infrastructure we have? We won't be able to you know, reinvent society to create a more egalitarian distribution of these, of these services. Uh, but what can we do that's practical? Can we introduce PrEP into certain settings and communities that we know would best benefit based on these simulations? That's really what we're getting at. And I'm also going to go um, a little bit briefly through racial and ethnic assertivity. Let me just Look at the time here. Okay, so we're kind of okay on time, which is quite surprising for, for me, usually. Um, racial and ethnic assertivity, I would argue, is extremely important, especially in Miami. You have a hugely diverse population, and we have uh, one of the larger Latino populations in, in Miami uh, that make up a bulk of, of new infections within the, within the county. We have a very high-risk African-American population um, that far exceeds the individual risk uh, of a Hispanic person in Miami. So despite them being, uh, despite this community being a minority within the uh, new diagnoses uh, within Miami, the, um, the African-American black community in Miami is at tremendously higher risk, um, especially um, uh, black females uh, in this community as we, can, as we can see through some of the data I'll show in a minute. Um, it's, really, it's really disheartening when you see the, um, uh, the, the sort of range of, of risk burden uh, within these communities. And so 
um, uh, we can we can sort of go at length about the importance of racial and ethnic assertivity assertivity within the model, but maybe uh, we'll just dive right into another one of these graphs to show sort of graphically the importance. Here, the um, the nodes represent uh, a racial ethnic stratum. So I don't define these. These are as defined by the Florida Department of Health and their surveillance reporting. So they make it rather easy on us um, with their four demographic uh, categories. So uh, this does not include orientation. Orientation is in the edges. Um, so we have white Hispanic, black non-Hispanic, white non-Hispanic, and then other, which encapsulates basically everything that is in these other categories. Uh, an astute observer <laughs> may realize that this this leaves out the possibility of, of being both black and Hispanic, which would probably be um, much to the chagrin of, say, the Haitian community within Miami. Uh, I would say this is um, a limitation of the Department of Health surveillance, but it's something that we have to deal with because they are the, the, the keeper of all of the data we need. So um, we're, we're sort of dealing with what we can. The census does allow, as many of you will know, uh, um, respondents to put both Hispanic um, ethnicity and black uh, racial status, um, but unfortunately the Florida Department of Health does not allow us to do that. Um, but we can see here that uh, assortivity in partnership selection does play a pretty pivotal role in the overall sexual network. We can see congregation of individuals up here in the, the top left. So the topology itself, sort of the space that each of these nodes in, is predicted essentially by a weight. So um, the more alike you are to other nodes around you and the more nodes you're connected to, the sort of tighter it is. And so I wouldn't read too much into the sort of shape of this. That's an artifact of the algorithm itself, but we can read into um, the prevalence of each of these uh, types of partnerships and the demographics themselves. This is all based on um, data from the census and, and the Department of Health. And we can see here that uh, racial and ethnic assertivity plays a huge role in predicting, you know, who has a partnership with whom. Uh, and here we can also see that, although, um, as I alluded to a minute ago, Hispanics don't um, experience a greater risk of HIV acquisition. Being Hispanic doesn't itself confer a large um, excess risk in acquiring HIV as compared to a white person. Um, as you can see here on the right, um, a very, very slight increase among women. But on the flip side of that, it plays a huge role in predicting access to prevention services, in, in predicting um, linkage to care and diagnosis, in also predicting ART adherence and ART enrollment to viral suppression. So even though we may be able to uh, say that his, the Hispanic population uh, in Miami does have some, some benefits uh, versus um, some marginalized communities elsewhere in the country, they don't experience greater acquisition um, com compared to white counterparts, uh, but they do experience disparities in these other services. So I think those are hugely important to, to accommodate, and that's exactly what we attempt to do in the model. Um, and as I mentioned before, this just uh, reprehensibly um, uh, large uh, disparity among, among black females, it's, it's really unfortunate that despite comparable levels of risk behavior to their white counterparts, it's really the sexual networks themselves that, that predict a large amount of this risk. And so um, it's really unfortunate that you can have communities where people um, may have similar risk behaviors, but still experience a much greater uh, burden of infection um, predicted largely because of the assortivity. And so that's something that we try our best to accommodate uh, within this modeling framework. And so I don't think I need to belabor that point anymore. I think it's, it's a hugely important facet of what we're doing. And this is just a, a brief mock-up of some of our outputs, which shows the prevalence of each of the types of relationships. And so you can see uh, in each of these boxes, the darker shades denote a more prevalent type of relationship. So it wouldn't be surprising to see that, um, uh, say, Hispanic to Hispanic uh, relationships would be most common in, in this community. And this is also just another proof of concept showing uh, more graphically with a, a, pinwheel, a pinwheel graph that things get complicated very quickly. Even when we're just talking about orientation, uh, we see that we have in the model men who have sex with men and exclusively and men who have sex with women. We have heterosexual males and um, heterosexual females. 
Um, so there is no same-sex female behavior in this because it's not very predictive of HIV acquisition. So we sort of leave that complexity out. But you can see that it gets complicated very quickly, even when we're just talking about these two, um, uh, two demographics. Uh, the, the, uh, the lines in between represent the type of relationship. So this is just a nice proof of concept to show that um, the, the model is working as it should, but also just an illustration of just how quickly things get, get quite complicated. So anyway, sort of bringing this back um, to where we started, I hope that by the end of this and sort of the, the teaser that some of these preliminary data show that we can anticipate our analyses to get back to these questions. So will Miami get to zero new infections? If so, when? What could be done to get them there faster, more efficiently? Um, I think that by the end of this project, we will have been able to tackle many of those. And hopefully some of you agree. And uh, just going through the limitations very quickly, I alluded to some of them earlier. Uh, so the HIV CDM, so what we call the model, the calibrated dynamic model, it draws on input from a wide range of empirical sources. We can't eliminate the biases that those sources themselves contain, so we just have to live with them. Uh, that's why we use this Bayesian melding-like procedure, um, so that we can incorporate uncertainty and, and do our best to distill it out. Um, the, the, the downside is that we, this requires many, many runs and huge computational uh, resources. And so uh, the parameter sets themselves are weighted uh, based on HIV prevalence within the community. We're limited, we're limited by the accuracy of these data. And I will say that there has been um, uh, a shift in my own thinking in this to use um, new diagnoses as a weighting material. This traditionally hasn't been done because of the lack of reliability within each stratum, but I do believe it will be a more rigorous weighting process. And again, we can talk about that if there's, if there's interest. Also, much is unknown about the undiagnosed population. We talked about that. And then risk behavior through injection drug use is not included specifically in this project, but we have the ability to do that, um, as well as differences in sexual risk behavior among those who use drugs. And some interventions are just difficult to model. So sex education, um, that's a very difficult thing to incorporate. Uh, luckily, the, the Florida Department of Health, the legislature, I'm sorry, so the, the Florida legislature um, has made some of this easy on us by just striking down comprehensive sex education bills over the last few years. So you could say um, kind of sardonically that uh, this has made our lives easier, but also probably not the best uh, forward thinking um, by the legislature. And then um, improved access to healthcare. This is you know, difficult to, to approximate. We have to take a lot of assumptions. So that ends um, the project itself. I, I left this slide here to talk you know, for a minute or two. So we're just about on time um, or over time, but I, I put this up just to sort of give it um, a quick um, sort of tease of some of the other work that's related to this that uh, myself and my lab are involved in. And so we're resubmitting a, um, a Getting to Zero grant, uh, which is based on the Getting to Zero PAR from NIH. Uh, that's a lot of acronyms. Um, and this is basically a proposal to look at ending the HIV epidemic in lots of different settings, including Miami, and specifically looking at, at the role of PrEP. And so this is a related issue. Um, and also, I, I have an R21 proposal we're resubmitting, uh, looking at the effectiveness of, of routine universal screening at Jackson Memorial Hospital, which is the largest hospital in the region and one of the largest in the country, and one of the largest uh, emergency departments in the country. They have a 2% positivity at screening. So really a tremendous opportunity um, to, to screen and, and come up with, um, with opportunities to link people to care if they have existing infection or to diagnose new infection. And then finally, um, I promise the speed talking will end once, uh, once we get through this. Um, uh, there's an R1 proposal uh, from a colleague of mine, Nadia Brelazam. Um, we're putting in uh, shortly for one of their rolling deadlines to model the interaction between coexisting uh, SARS-CoV infection, SARS-CoV-2 infection, and HIV infection. And so we we're gonna focus on Miami as well as other cities and access to treatment. And so we're, we'll look at the disease outcomes within both of these epidemics. And um, we've, I've run out of time, so I won't take you through this um, if, uh, if we're out of time, but basically this was a quick mock-up that I made for the proposal that we're submitting where I would adapt the, uh, uh, an overlay of social um, connections uh, with a risk of COVID transmission or, or SARS-CoV-2 transmission uh, within the, the network in, say, Miami. And so this is an approximation of what one of those networks might look like. 
with sexual um, contacts, casual or household contacts, and then you know basically the um, the effect that the pandemic has had on access to care. We can see here that in that second um, uh, bubble over there, um, 20 weeks into the simulation, we have a treatment disruption due to the pandemic, which we can approximate, and also uh, transmission and um, lots of things that we, lots of big questions we have with that. But again, that's that's a um, uh, uh, a very recent um, proposal and thought as, as you might expect. So uh, thanks so much for paying attention. I hope that as far as Zoom calls go, this was you know um, something something interesting uh, for the town hall. So I would love to share. Um, uh, oh, just go back one sec. I'd love to share thanks um, to everyone at Harvard, at at um, FIU, the DOH, um, Miami, and elsewhere, and of course NIH for funding this. So thanks so much. Um, please, any anything you would like to talk about. Thanks very much, Daniel. That was really very interesting. Uh, we do have one question in the chat, in the, or comment in the chat. I wonder if language, uh, in particular Spanish, is also a bridge to make a sexual connection in addition to race and ethnicity. Yeah, and so this is one of the things that we sort of intrinsically incorporate based on surveys that we've done. So some of this was also um, taken from preliminary data from, from Nadia Bolazam's prior work, which was looking at dating apps and to see the assortivity in partnership selection based on those apps. And we can look specifically within Hispanic and Latino populations to see the assortivity of who's selecting whom. And that does have, um, I believe, um, sort of a, a, um, a note of, of language, but this would be, on a macro level, it might be difficult for us to incorporate something beyond just ethnicity or, um, or race at this point but it's certainly something that we can consider. Some of that would be intrinsically built into the data we have, and we wouldn't necessarily need to go beyond, but, um, but some of it would, especially if you talk about populations, non-Spanish speaking Latino populations, like say the Haitian Creole population. So it does get complicated quickly. Thank you. Uh, another question, it, it was intriguing that, um, in particular for African Americans, there was that disproportionality, disproportionate burden of HIV in Miami. Yeah. Do you have any sense of what is driving that in particular in Miami? Yeah, it's it's really um, it's really uh, it's it's a difficult situation to look at because um, you see a, a syndemic that is prolific throughout the country, especially in the South, where you see a reduction in access to prevention services and a, um, uh, a lack of attention paid to, to, the, to the communities that have the highest risk. And so, as I alluded to before, I think much of the risk, especially for African-American women, is the sexual network itself. So uh, there are some great studies coming out of the University of North Carolina that show um, the, that intrinsic risk acquisition of HIV and other STIs is uh, predominantly determined by the network and not the behavior itself. So we can't even necessarily say, necessarily say it's something inherent within the community's risk behavior, but just the topology of the network itself. And that's something that indeed we're going to look specifically into. So we can look at those network graphs and we can say, what are the fundamental aspects of, of this community that makes it different from other communities? And getting the, uh, the assortivity right is, is quite challenging. And this is the first project in which we're trying to take that on, but um, it's a necessary step. So I would say I don't have a clear answer to all of the disparity that's, that's observed, but we definitely have some suspicions. Uh, one last question and just, uh, uh, we only have a lot of two minutes left, but uh, have you been able to share the results of this work with, and has it influenced the getting to zero activities that are happening or funded interventions happening in Miami? Yeah, so the good part is, uh, as I said, this was part of a K, and before I did any of the substantive work, I tried to make sure there was an adequate team on the ground um, in order to help diffuse this um, within a policy level. So I'm lucky that although Miami doesn't have the same research infrastructure that some other major cities do, um, I've been able to sort of get across the importance of, of relaying some of this. So. I will say that given we're still only say about halfway through the project right now, we haven't um, come up with the, the most salient findings, but we have had, uh, I have shared some initial 
things. Um, say at, at a lecture at FIU I gave last year, I shared some of these preliminary data and um, with, uh, with partners down in Miami, the FDOH, for instance, I'm trying to get um, care continua data from them right now through Ryan White and some other sources. And it's a big slog, but um, yes, yeah, slowly it gets distilled. I will say that the Getting to Zero Task Force itself is a semi um, uh, continuing, continuing entity. It was kind of a one off thing. Um, the partner still exists, but it's, there's a question of, you know, if it has any teeth to the implementation. Uh, so that's, that's yet to be answered. Um, it, it has to deal with a lot of the same politics that many other cities do, except, except probably more, more so. Well, we're, we're out of time. So thank you so very much, Daniel, for your time and for this really interesting talk. Um, and folks, I know there was one or two questions in the chat that we weren't able to get to today, but please feel free to email those directly um, to Dan uh, to get those responded to. Again, thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, thank you're you welcome. Thank you for joining today. Have a great rest of your Tuesday.